Supercell is a company known for making a number of games in the freemium market. Games known for being free, while also being a bit pay to win to encourage spending. This gave them some of the most profitable games that the mobile industry had ever seen, and made Supercell into a popular name amongst not only the mobile game market, but also the gaming industry as a whole. But nowadays, I rarely ever hear anything from them. In the world of mobile games, the best performing games often fall under a select couple of genres, tried and true formulas that are specifically designed to work over the ages. The discoverers of these formulas push the envelope, and it's up to everybody else to catch up. And the story of Supercell is no different. With the rise of the internet, it provides a constantly changing environment. So it's not uncommon to see games in one entry of a series, receiving spin-offs with completely different mechanics and formulas. Clash of Clans was once in the forefront of the base building simulation genre, and it even ended up becoming the highest grossing mobile game. But as the times change, so does the type of game that will do well. People get bored of things rather quickly, and something that works one year may not be as successful the next. So the main goal seems to be to create a game with a new and improved strategy whenever people start to get tired and move on. This happens to be the exact business model of Finnish mobile game company Supercell. It all started when CEO Ilka Penanen decided to start a company with five other individuals, after coming up with the idea of making a game with what was, at the time, referred to as cross-platform services, which is now more popularly known as crossplay. He was hoping that by making a game accessible on as many platforms as possible, he'd be able to garner a player base and continue updating that game. In May of 2010, the founders put their personal funds together, and Supercell was formed. And with that, they began working on their very first publicly available game. Their office consisted of a singular room measuring 30 square meters, which contained only six tables, some computers, and a coffee maker. Over the following months, more and more people would get to work on the project with upwards of 15 people cramped inside that tiny room. But after one year of hard work, in 2011, they were able to finally release their debut game title, a 3D browser-based MMORPG by the name of Gunshine.net. To start things off, they designed the game to run on online desktops and Facebook, since that's where the majority of the gaming audience was. Then they began planning on how to go about making a cross-compatible mobile version. Issues quickly arose with how to go about adapting the mouse and keyboard controls. And while doing that, they realized how people play mobile games with a different set of priorities than they would on PC. They didn't account for the idea that a lot of people only play these games for minutes at a time, which isn't something you could really do with a long-term multiplayer RPG. In the summer of 2011, Gunshine averaged 500,000 monthly players, a very impressive number when you consider the actual size of the operation they were running. But the team slowly grew to become disenfranchised with the project, seeing its most potent fundamental flaws. That being, the game didn't seem to have enough going on to keep people invested. The most active players would only stick around for about one to two months before moving on to other games. It simply wasn't engaging enough to retain an audience for years at a time, which was the initial vision for the game. But the team discovered something while scrapping Gunshine Mobile. They had ordered some iPads for the office, and learned about just how different things really were. They decided that their initial strategy wouldn't work with such different platforms, so they decided to completely change up their approach. They wanted to put all of their time into this new market spending all their time creating good games for mobile and nowhere else. They cancelled all operations for PC games. After all, there's a reason they only have five currently available games. Cancelling projects is something Supercell would do constantly, with the logic that it's better to kill a project as early as possible so they can focus on creating something better instead. This happened to a number of early Supercell games. Pets vs. Orcs was their first mobile game to be cancelled, but other projects, like the placeholder names Magic and Tower, were made into a closed beta then later abandoned. 
Supercell was in a place of uncertainty. They needed at least one of the projects they were working on to be a moderate success. And if that doesn't happen, the company wouldn't continue. Throughout these What Killed videos, you may begin to see an ongoing theme, that in the beginning of the mobile game industry, one game is all it really takes to launch a company into the mainstream. And with Supercell, that one game was right around the corner. One of the games they were working on was their own take at modernizing the farming simulator genre. That game, with the codename Soil, was designed as a mobile version of Farmville and other games of that nature. They ended up releasing it under the name Heyday. And even early on, people quickly grew attached. The game was designed to be as social as possible, with player-run stands being a large focus of the gameplay loop. Not to mention that, for the time, the user interface was incredibly refined, with you being able to drag things around instead of cluttered up virtual buttons and sticks that were more prevalent then. The general idea of the gameplay is something that wasn't really considered at the time. In most mobile games, you hop on and play a few levels, or try to get a high score on an endless game. But here, you're able to hop on the game and play it for a few minutes, making a slight bit of progress, then getting off for the rest of the day. And this led to a longer attachment to keep people pushing forward. The game's success was very unexpected, life-changing even, and Supercell continued to work hard on the game while also bringing back ideas from an older, cancelled project. Two months later, and Heyday would no longer look like that big of a hit. Clash of Clans, originally being the second game to go by the codename Magic, would be released in August of 2012. They took the fundamental idea from Heyday and put it in a much more interesting environment, along with some new elements of the gameplay. Clash of Clans holds a large emphasis on attacking and defending bases, with progress being the improvements to your home base and higher level troops. This wasn't possible in a game like Heyday, cause the game's aesthetic as a whole was much more peaceful. And while the game did really well, the number of downloads isn't why this game did so well financially. That success would be in the form of microtransactions. Clash of Clans doesn't force you to watch any advertisements, so they got creative with how the game was monetized. Games in the building genre are designed with a lot of waiting in mind. That way, people grow some long-form attachment and continue to play the game for weeks on end. But what happens when someone with expendable income gets tired of waiting? Well, that leads to the purchasing of gems to skip the waiting time so they can get back to the core gameplay. This obviously caused quite a bit of criticism to be levied towards the company, for the game being deemed as pay to win. While it's still possible to get anything in the game without spending money, instead of spending your money, you'd be spending hours of your life to achieve the same thing. While the microtransactions annoyed some, it left Supercell with a lot of profit. In fact, from 2015 to 2016, Clash of Clans would continue to be the highest grossing mobile game ever, with its place being held on the top of the charts for nearly a full year straight. Two years later, they'd release Boom Beach. It was yet another version of the Heyday Base Builder format, but this time focusing on a military aesthetic. It grew to be moderately successful in and of itself, but personally, I feel it didn't alter the format enough to really make an impact. Clash Royale was released March 2nd, 2016, four years after Clash of Clans. It was a spin-off that touted more features, deeper gameplay, and a completely different gameplay loop with the main content of the game revolving around direct PvP battles, expanding on one similar aspect from Clash of Clans, and deepening the mechanics to make it its own game. In June of 2016, at the peak of their popularity, Supercell founders would sell the company to Chinese holding company Tencent for $8.6 billion, leaving most of their 340 employees with complete financial freedom. While that's wonderful to see, it could have very well been damaging to their motivation. As, when you have enough money to live the rest of your life without working, a lot of the stakes that come from working simply aren't there anymore. The game would go on to overtake Clash of Clans in popularity for a full year, especially when all the new updates would continue to be rolling in. 
but Clash Royale went on to suffer with its own issues. The pay-to-win monetization was a lot more obvious here, as the more direct battle system let you see firsthand that spending money is by far the easiest way to get legendary cards, which used to be incredibly rare to get. Free-to-play players would get discouraged by this as the people spending thousands would be in an objectively better spot before a match even began. But Clash Royale didn't just suffer from its own isolated issues. 2016 also happened to be the year of Pokemon Go, a game which ended up hitting its own peak in that same summer of 2016, a key point in time where growth for Clash Royale would have been the best. But instead, Pokemon Go went on to overtake Clash Royale in less than a month after its worldwide debut. Nonetheless, the game still got a number of new updates, and Clash Royale would remain very popular despite some hiccups along the way, with its popularity gradually declining as the new updates would feel less and less unique and exciting. The very next year, Brawl Stars was released. It was a new IP with a new idea, 3 vs 3 combat, and fun wacky new characters. I'm not gonna go into too much detail since this isn't a Clash game, but it took the head to head combat Clash Royale did so well, and they expanded that into a completely different but equally enjoyable experience. As the years kept passing, Supercell would add more and more content to Clash of Clans, and while this made it even better for the more experienced, higher leveled players, it also made Clash of Clans a much more intimidating game to get into. In its current state, it would take a new free-to-play player entire years just to make it to the end game. This puts Supercell in a lose-lose situation. They could continue releasing updates and leaving new players isolated, or they could not release updates and drive away their existing dedicated player base. Most would agree that updating the game is absolutely necessary, as even though Clash of Clans is currently only 6% as popular as it was at its peak, that popularity is still insanely high, and squandering that is out of the question. Supercell's solution was to continue incorporating new updates, while also ensuring to make game progression faster. Clash Royale had a massive rebound in October of 2021, which was most likely thanks to TikTok growth in the form of the hee 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 ha <laughs> soundbite and hog rider memes, as well as new updates increasing the ease of early game player progression. However, like all other TikTok trends, that newfound success didn't last forever, and the game has gone back down to its usual popularity. Currently, Clash Royale and Clash of Clans are at an even spot, with both of which getting new updates this year, even if the majority of old players aren't sticking around to watch how these changes play out. Other free-to-play games would go on to have the Clash gameplay loop refined. Games like Fortnite would manage to become more appealing to new players with the only incentive to spend real money being cosmetic items and skins, allowing for free-to-play users to play on the same level as people who've spent real money. Supercell as a whole is continuing to do well today with Brawl Stars, as well as some new endeavors. They're actually working on two new games to add to the Clash series, Clash Mini and Clash Heroes. So what killed the Clash series? Well, at this point, the series isn't exactly dead. In fact, they're only now entering the point where they have to branch out to new spin-offs. However, these two new games could very well end up leaving Clash feeling like a more stale series than ever. Supercell is a company that obviously believes in quality over quantity, with only five currently active games and many, many more in the ever-growing graveyard of cancelled titles. And with so many successful titles, I have no doubt that a recovery is possible. The newest game they may be releasing is Squad Busters, which is a crossover game featuring the likenesses of characters from every game they've released, including both Clash of Clans and Royale. It looks pretty promising, but I fear that, paired with the other new games, we may start to see the Clash series being milked more and more for the years to come, which doesn't spell great things for what the future may hold. At the very least, it took them this long to start selling out, which is more than I could say about other franchises, like Cut the Rope and Angry Birds. In February of 2022, CEO Ilka Paninen himself would make a blog post about the future of the company, where he says he's changed the company's method of working, 
as the old five-person group method wasn't seeing great results anymore, especially when working on the larger games. I hope Supercell can someday achieve a similar amount of success to their initial hype. But even if that never ends up happening, it's safe to say that Supercell played a role in the childhoods of many, and made school just a little more bearable.